they like boom all the like twerk and giving days. Boom, boom, boom. Boom. Okay, so let's get started for the day. Sorry about the mix up in terms of um, communication with when the first reading assignment, the first reading review was due. Moodle has this habit of always, from whenever you create it, setting the deadline one week after that. And I think I had noted that the deadline was, uh, was Monday, but Moodle helped you out by making it Wednesday. I'm fine with that. Uh, so for now, if you haven't done your review, just get that first review in by Wednesday. And I, I put it roughly at class time, but uh, again, a couple minutes or an hour or so, I don't, I'm not going to look at that as far as late. Uh, it's just to have you come to class having done a review, just like we used to in terms of handing in a paper copy that should be have to get it done by that time of lecture. Otherwise, I, I did post uh, each week, I'll try to kind of keep to this format of having lecture slides. And these, do, these don't uh, necessarily mean an order, or at least how much we'll get to in that one week. I'm expecting, at least for this week, uh, part of these slides to carry over into next week. Uh, but they do go along with the textbook reading assignment. And, and from now on, I'm just listing the reading assignment here, and it should go to uh, an actual page that just simply specifies, according to a quantitative approach, what sections. And these sections are over instruction level parallelism limits in superscalar architecture, so exactly what we're covering in class. Otherwise, if you look, we also have another paper reading assignment. Uh, this will get easier. So, so uh, I'll poll the class. At least you can uh, vote if you want to. How long did you spend reading that first paper? Somebody could volunteer their time. Oh, about an hour, hour and a half. An hour I have. Does anyone, do, do I bid higher? Do I have a six hour? Six hours. Did you choose a really weird paper? <laughs> so, so it could take that long. You know, this might be your first time reading a conference paper. Uh, it's, again, hopefully the notes by Bill Daly led you a little bit in terms of what to look for. Uh, once you go to your second paper, your third paper, your fourth paper, fifth, then you will get that many papers. You'll, you will become more seasoned at extracting the architecture information from that. It's also the fact that there might have been a lot of terms uh, within the paper that you selected that you had to review on or go slowly. I understand that. Um, but it's good practice, especially for those, anyone going on for a PhD. Let me, let me pull the class at that, too. How many people are here for PhDs? One, two, three, four. So only four. Hmm. We'll see, we'll see if we can't boost that up by the end of class, uh, end of the semester. Not, don't, don't t not one class, but end of the semester, maybe we can boost that. Another thing I wanted to bring to people's attention, if you are interested in computer architecture elements, there is a conference going on. This is a little more of a compiler conference, but there's LCPC uh, uh, conference up in Fort Collins next week. I was going to try to see if anyone would want to go to this. Uh, so this is up at, you can look at it here in terms of the web, website, but it's the 24th International Workshop on Languages and Compilers, LCPC, uh, for Parallel Computing. It's up in Fort Collins. Uh, is that, would any, had anyone heard of this or were, was going to attend this before me bringing it up? So one person? Okay, so what we might try to do is if people are interested, if people want to go to this, and you can check the program in terms of uh, guest, the keynote speakers, as well as the paper content. You might see that a couple paper contents relate to uh, things happening here. So Dirk Grunwald has a paper. Uh, there's also Justin Goschlik, who's now at Intel, who was a PhD student here last semester. Uh, but it's, it's a two and a half day event. They cover a lot of things. So take a look at this, and I'll, I'll post this web link to the Moodle website. If you're interested in going, you don't have to attend every day. Uh, but it's only a $50 registration for that two and a half days, and they give you breakfast, lunch, uh, and they might take you out to a banquet at the evening. I'm not exactly sure. but So for $50 student registration, it's quite a deal to, to go see what's happening in industry and meet other, other people uh, in this area. So I'll post that. There's also workshops on Saturday as well. Is there on Saturday? So is that part of the, the CNC? Uh, workshop, the CNC workshop. So there's also this concurrent collections workshop uh, that has another listing, whole set of uh, workshop papers. So, so I'll, I'll post that. So if you're interested in going, let me know. I'd at least like to like to hear back from me if you are interested. Um, do you, are you going with your advisor? I'm just going. You're just going. Um,
I mean, I'll make you a deal. If you go to this, you don't have to do a paper review in the, the semester. I mean, it's kind of a trade. It's kind of like $50 to go to the workshop or write a paper review. It's, it's one of those. You'll get enough out of the workshop that I think it's well. <laughs> I don't know whose time is equivalent between those, the, the five to six hours to read a paper or going to the workshop. But Okay, in any case, I've posted some additional slides. Uh, there's also a reading assignment. And again, for this reading assignment, I've posted the web link for it, assignment link different from the paper list. In this paper list, I, you know, I start giving you some suggested papers, realizing that some of the early architecture papers, like Thomas Sulu's algorithm, uh, this might be hard to find in a, a PDF form. Uh, I haven't actually searched for that one yet, but if I find one, I'll post it to our Moodle website so that you have access to it. And there, then there's also a paper on uh, implementation of precise interrupts by one of the professors here at UC Boulder. Um, but otherwise, any papers from your own selection regarding hardware cache memory or dynamic execution. We're, we're kind of transitioning out of uh, review concepts, um, but I think this week is still somewhat at least leveraging concepts from pipelining that now you can see scale up in terms of for superscalar execution. So, so let's, let's see where we left off just talking about cache or talking about branch prediction. Um, and we're right about to finish it, so are there any questions on the different styles of branch predictors? So we started to go through these nine variations that Seiyu Ye and Yale Pat had put together. Uh, and while this was some time ago, there has been a lot of, of variation. So for instance, just to review where we left off, we said that there's two ways to access the, a two-level branch predictor. The first is how much global information are you going to maintain or, or how are you going to maintain the branch history of information. First way is global. So all of these first schemes are all global schemes in that they collect every branch history execution into one history register. So in each of these pictures, the GAG, GAS, and GAP, but it's whether or not the uh, separate history tables are provided on a per branch basis. That would be on the GAP system, the GAP, or the GAS, which just is a combination of the GAG and the GAP in that you have groupings of branches that all share the same branch table. And then finally, the GAG, which was the base one to start off with for the Pentium Pro, uh, meaning that uh, an early superscalar architecture where it started to get more important to have greater branch prediction accuracy. And this one was just a GAG in that all branches uh, communicate and share their information to the history register and then uh, share the correlation table as well or the history table. So any questions on this? Oh, okay, so the variations then are if you keep track of a per address information on the branches, that allows you to have more resolution on branches that have patterns versus just global correlation. Remember, global correlation is between branches. A uh, branch of several cycles ago might actually influence the branch behavior of the current branch, but a per address scheme allows the history to be collected separately, so there's no interference on the actual history uh, collection, but then on the table-wise, you have those same three variations. Global single table would be the PAG. Uh, PAP would be each branch within the branch target buffer maintains its own uh, history register and its own history table. So you should view this as the most expensive when it comes to real estate. It's really separating out the correlation to be only on the per branch, its uh, individual branch itself. Again, the set is just a more cost-effective way that says most of the time these history tables are going to really resolve to almost the same entries between similar branches. So if you have branch B that's looking up into this entry, maybe at its history location 101010, it's going to predict taken or one for the next branch execution. Well, a branch down here in the lower port, port uh, portion of this array of history registers, if this branch is also 101010, but points to this column or this history table, chances are the 101010 entry will also go to taken or one in this. 
So you'd have a lot of overlap. And a lot of what this PAS system does is say, if there is no uh, deconstructive aliasing, negative aliasing, then you might as well put those branches together. The thing is, the way that these sets of branches share or, or get located into the same array of history tables is simply based upon their program counter. So just like hashing addresses you use in caches, simply say the hardware has to do all of this lookup very quickly. Remember, and that was one of the questions somebody had before classes, remember this structure has to be accessed either in one clock cycle or ahead of time. So if you're accessing current with the current program counter um, in the BTB, it has to look up into this history register, and that has to go over to this memory and return back so that the, that same cycle you have a speculative program counter so that you can begin fetching the very next cycle. When you refer to aliasing, are you referring to like duplication of? Uh, the aliasing, one example was the aliasing was back here with this example, which just simply said um, there's, there's a lot of different forms of aliasing. For instance, let me see if I can get this. Show integrity. Let me try it this way. So one of the ways that this was an aliasing example is for this branch here. If it uh, had encountered two of these paths, and so the paths back here were just named AMY, uh, just artificially that that's block A, block M, block Y, same thing with B block. So if you come from this path, AMY, then this one is really putting into a two-bit history register the fact that it got to that branch as taken, taken, or 1-1. One, one. So if we're using a GAG system, the global history register of two bits is going to be a 1-1. One, one. And that's going to look up into one history table location just at the very end. So if we're talking about two bits, 1-1 one, one would dial in to that last two-bit saturate encounter. Well, we know for this path AMY, since AA is equal to zero, and if it goes taken, we know that AA is zero. If it goes branch taken here at block M to here, then at this question of branch greater than zero, we know that AA is still zero. So the outcome of this path should be not taken. And if we come down this path of BMY, we also have a taken taken. So the same exact history information for this branch should always go take it. So in this case, it's not branches aliasing, it's paths. This path and this path are both using the same history lookup, but we know that they're going to be fighting it out. So if, if you execute AMY, 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 and coming back around, the saturated counter here will be not taken, because that's what AMY leads to. If you go AMY, 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 BMY, that's going to be predicted false, and the BMY will start to lean this saturating counter back to predict taken eventually. So that's one form of aliasing. It's, it's when the branch system should be you know, ideally differentiating paths, but it's not because it's just a collection of ones and zeros used to look up as a hashing key into some structure. So there's also constructive aliasing too, So meaning that this path of taken, taken, you know, taken, 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 if there had been another branch taken, taken, taken up here, um, this branch might actually, uh, some other execution might prime whole another region of code to that same thing. It's a very common path, right? So if you have, just like any branch, if you have all takens in a row, five takens, that's going to look up into a history table location that probably is dominated by saturated counter of 1-1, one, one, strongly taken. So that's going to help out a, another, a whole other set of branches, even if you really haven't trained on those other branches yet. So if instead of a global um, pattern history table, you had a per address one, um, that would solve the aliasing. Is that correct? Or is that? Yes, that, that would go ahead and differentiate between having any collisions of uh, of uh, other pathways. The, on, the only thing is that's a different form of correlation. There you've really just taken the systems like a one-bit and a two-bit system and unrolled the automata to be a history register. So now all you can capture is, again, self-correlating history. Okay. So let me get out of there without killing 
integrity. Okay, so coming back to a couple of deviations, we've seen the PAG. These are just blow up pictures of that. Isolate a little bit higher PAP systems. SAS, SAG, SAP are just again hybrid per branch global systems. And they say, well, it's too expensive to maintain information on every branch. It's too expensive to have a table for every branch. The set systems, especially the SAS, says, why don't we just allow groups of branches to share the locations, and thus you're, you're not having uh, cost of, of generating a per branch scheme. Uh, at the same time, you could collect based upon some positive aliasing. So, so this is where we sort of left off. That was review, but you want to know where that plays out. So if we look across time, and there has been static, branches, st static branch prediction to just help the pipeline for very short pipelines, things like always not taken, always taken, backward taken, uh, forward not taken, compiler directed where the compiler provides an opcode hint so that uh, when it's decoded, when the opcode is decoded, one, or one bit might indicate that branch is predominantly going taken, so at this point the pipeline should predict uh, taken. A one bit history we saw with that, two bit history, a whole bunch of systems deploying it, but you see that there's a far range now and each, and it, each time we elevate the performance going up. The P6 here, just as a code name, this is the Pentium Pro. This is the sixth generation of x86 by Intel. Uh, this is a superscalar model, um, greater than the Pentium, where the Pentium is just executing really two integer operations that are independent per cycle, where the P6 could go ahead and execute six instructions per cycle, six micro ops. So at this point, you know, the aggregate prediction, what you would say as far as where the technology is at, it's roughly about 95%. You might find an application that uh, the branch predictor is not doing well on. It might be as low as 80%, could be anywhere, but the general view is applications in that range to average 90, 95%. Uh, so there's a lot of other systems that you can play around with in terms of selection of the global and even local histories. So we see this system called GShare. And GShare has a single global branch history and a single branch history table, but now you're indexing into the history table differently than just using purely the history register. Now what you're going to do in this particular s scheme is to XOR the branch address and the global history, and that together hashes into a location that is really, again, customized for that branch location as opposed to a, a typical GAG scheme where all branches can influence the history table. This one just partitions it out based upon an XOR feature. And then similarly, GSelect, GSelect does a concatenation to look into the history table. This last one, YAGS, which was called yet another G-Share predictor, that was the actual name for it, uh, started looking at things like variable history length predictors. So rather than just say 12-bit history is always going to be looked up, well, at some branches, we start to learn that a, a particular branch might only be correlated to the last three branches. So there's no reason to have a history register for it, have kept track of the last 12, even if you keep track of it, you only want the three bits, re the three recent branches, to then look up into the history table for that branch. But that requires a learning system. You have to know that this branch is correlated to something in the last three window. This other branch might be correlated to something eight instructions back. That again requires more uh, learning in the system. So there's a question. Yeah, I was just idly curious. So that takes us up to the P6 or the Premium Pro. What is kind of like the state of the art now as far as percentages? Uh, yeah, so, so let me get to that. Uh, in terms of percentages, the branch predictor people will tell you that we're at 97%. Um, there, there's a lot of ways to prove that. In fact, the first checkpoint that I've been working on that I'll give to you on Wednesday is actually to run benchmarks and see what the branch prediction uh, behavior is. And you have an opportunity to make your own branch predictor. At this point in time, when you see this, you should as most architects are, you should think that you have a way of solving it. Say, so, wow, you know, I bet you I could think of something to predict just a few more percent, something that hasn't been tried before. And that's part of what the checkpoint allows you to do, is to study the behavior of these branches and then start saying, well, what if we had a tournament predictor that had three voters, 
three branch predictors and we tied them together? What about four? What about five? What about systems of different size? And so you'll see some techniques, but generally it's about 97%. Uh, besides talking about the aliasing, which we did a little bit about, um, I, I will answer at least what the latest Intel processors do in terms of branch prediction. Um, but let, let's get through some of this. Some issues that, that uh, you have to understand, especially in trying to match simulators up to what the actual hardware is doing. First of all, training time. Uh, when, you, when you do have uh, large history tables, there is some time that you know, the branch predictors need to build up uh, some type of correct correlation. So some steady state point. So you might find that the, if you're tracking over time, you might see a two-bit predictor you know, reach its kind of saturating point of branch prediction right away, whereas the two-level predictors take some time to come up because they're in that first phase. They're actually you know, building up more information in the table. Other things people have looked at as far as affecting this is Things such as stale state, so predictors updated after information, or sorry, uh, let's go to this one, operating system context switches. Upon a context switch, all of the information that are in these hardware tables, buffers, uh, gets really flushed out with respect to matching up the next application. So when we're studying in the simulation domain, as opposed to the real domain of computers, uh, operating system context will periodically cause the branch predictors to lose information and lower the performance. With a simulator, we can run a simulated program through a billion instructions. There's not going to be any cache flushes or operating system context switches. So that's important to note. So you're saying that the history tables get cleared out? The history tables, uh, it's not so much the history tables need to get cleared out. It's more of that the BTB that matches the addresses won't correspond to the new addresses coming in for another virtual process. So even if the history table information is left as it is to predict, just say, taken or not taken, uh, it's really the other functionality of the BTB that says the program counter has matched, and here's the target address in case you predict taken. Uh, if the branch predictor always has predicted not taken, that doesn't necessarily have to be in the BTB. It's just the notion of the next fall-through address. But if you're going to have a streak of taken branches, you need to have that BTB working. <coughs> Uh, other information in terms of, of what's happening with the BTBs is, and the whole branch prediction strategy is a stale state. So, and it's hard to draw this picture of. I was thinking about um, how I could do this. So imagine that, let's get back to at least the GAG system. So here's a GAG system, and we said this was deployed in one of the, uh, the first deep pipelines to about 16 stages. Well, in those stages, you really don't figure out where the branch uh, outcome is until about maybe the eighth or ninth stage. So you've already started to fetch more work into the machine. And the issue is this. You might encounter back-to-back -back branches. So if you encounter this branch, and I'll, uh, hopefully there's a way on the PDF I don't have to keep flashing to this, but we'll figure it out. So, so let's look at this. If this is the very first branch address. So we're going to use this. We have to make some prediction right now. And we're going to use this history register. We've already hit in the BTB, but this is the current history register. We're going to look up into this entry, and this entry says predict taken, because it's 1, 0 if we're using that 2-bit system. Based upon this, if that's correct, and we do go taken, then the next time we encounter this history, or the next history register, what we have to do is say that this here should get updated to 1-1. One, one. Because if this branch does go taken, if this prediction is correct, then the very next time we encounter this same exact pattern, we should encounter a 1-1. One, one. But we actually don't know it's correct yet. We won't know that's correct until this, pre this predicted instruction makes its way through the pipeline and then actually resolves the comparison branch. In the meantime, if we haven't updated this, the very next branch that is still speculative, so imagine you just have a, a string of 10 branches in a row, even if it's here's the branch, predict taken over to here, and there's a branch there that jumps over to here. At each location, you might run 10 branches in a row. You have to speculatively update this. Otherwise, it's going to be stale information for however many branches you've just gone through. And that in itself, if you don't speculatively update until you know it's correct, you might actually mispredict more branches. And so that's something that they actually have 
worked on doing is speculative updates to the BTB if the, uh, or the branch prediction logic. If you're wrong, you roll back those, info, those entries. Very complex in terms of trying to get those branches correct. Okay, other systems let's get to. And we, I just kind of gave you the teaser as far as this particular slide being a hybrid predictor or a tournament predictor, the notion of you have global history that you can begin looking up with the current program counter. Same thing with the global, uh, sorry, the program counter. And then the uh, global history can look up with the global prediction. Those can meet in the middle, can require more space. You're now having more information about... Uh, Either a local predictor or a global predictor could increase your chip die size. 2% might not seem like much, but again, you've, you've kept doing that in terms of it's not a 2% increase, it's 2% of the total die area. One generation just made it to get half of 1%, so going from 96% accuracy to 96.5% accuracy. Um, so a lot of tournament predictors as far as um, reasoning out. This is just some view of what uh, the, the Hennessy and Patterson text goes through that says local two-bit counters across, I think they were looking at the spec benchmark suite for this, versus correlating schemes, uh, versus tournament predictors, looking at cost and going out, just showing that as kind of a pair two curve that says if cost isn't a limit or the higher, the co the higher cost in terms of, of kilobits, the tournament predictor will start you know, getting better performance in the middle range or the lower range here, it's not worth very much. It's, it's better to have larger structures of that global history and the local history, something what you'd expect. And you have to say, each generation, you might pay some of the bits towards this uh, payoff in terms of more branch prediction. So, so things what have, that have led up to the 97% that people would quote, there's a couple things that they start doing, not just branch prediction, but also then trying to improve the pipeline uh, perform performance um, with the branch predictor. So one of the ideas that came out in the HALEM was a loop predictor. And this might not seem like very much. We said most loops, if they're going to execute a 1,000 times or branch for a 1,000 times, you're really only going to miss one or two, the first time you encounter it and the last time you encounter it. But if that's in a nesting loop, this could add up millions of times. So loop nest, loop nest, loop nest this is going to lead to a lot of lost uh, performance. In addition, if you're in a small loop, what you, want to pre what, what you want to predict is not just going back to the instruction address and the cache. The fact that what uh, a lot of these architectures now do is, if you, if you think about this pipeline, and I have to pull it down to be able to draw on it, uh, if you look at this pipeline, it's traditionally you branch predict, then you fetch, then you decode, well, if we have a loop stream predictor that we know that this is just a tightly coupled loop that we're just predicting back, uh, what we actually want to do is cache off the, the already decoded instructions. So the x86 instruction set gets broken down into what we'll see as many smaller micro ops. And rather than have the branch predictor locate the next program counter, let's have it locate into a buffer that has already pre-decoded instructions because, again, loop buffers most of the time you're not doing very complex control flow. So what this is going to do, fusing it with the loop stream predictor, is skip over the need really for fetching and decoding. So now it looks like maybe your 25 stage pipeline is only back to about 16 to 18 stages. And if it's a highly predictable loop, uh, you'll, that will save you a lot in terms of power consumption as well as pipe stages. What the loop predictors do is effectively recognize uh, that through state machine analysis, um, if this branch does go for a thousand times and then goes not taken, then the next time it's executed again, it, it starts a counter. So you start seeing this buildup of each BTB entry. Each entry could be a counter branch, and they just look at it as a pattern. Is there a predefined notion or, or two back-to-back -back periods of time where it went a thousand branches, then fall through, next time a thousand branches, then fall through? If so, Next time it executes, we'll start a counter at 1,000. Each time it predicts or executes, we'll count down. And on that last one, we'll get it correct. So we'll save back that one branch. It seems like a lot of hardware, but it gets one branch per loop, per iteration. And I think I talked about how most interesting loops 
most codes have about three or six levels of, of iterations. Did I talk about the MRI code? Okay, there you go. So typical what you want to go faster. One last category, you might not think about this. This also applies to um, non-conditional or unconditional jumps. So a jump that always goes one direction still needs to be predicted at the time it's being fetched. Uh, same thing with the return address stack. Uh, and, and I might need a picture for this to show you. So I, I made sure to pull up PowerPoint ahead of time so maybe I can draw on this without changing it. Um, if it does. Come up here. Where was it at? This side. There's our pen. Okay, so, so let's look at this. When we're in a function, so here's function x, and there's a call location here. And that call location is calling over to function y. We do some code, and even for this sake, if it's just straight line code, if we get to some point in it, it doesn't have to be the end point, but then we return, and we should return back the instruction right after the call. So this might not seem like very complex, but the notion is for this return spot, Given that all of these instructions are mapped into memory, let's just say that this return is happening at address 4000. At 4000, since this is a control instruction, it's, it's, an, it's an unconditional one, in which case it should always return to one location. It's not an if statement or a comparison branch. But what happens in the system is for this address at 4000, 4000 goes into the BTB structure and the whole system, the branch target buffer system, is supposed to memorize where this should go back to for future sense. So after this one execution from function x through function y and back, it says 4,000, and I'll make this address over here, 8,000, where we called, and the return back point is 8,004. So this is the very next instruction after the subroutine call, which we'll just make an add. So in this case, the BTB structure will say, well, this is an unconditional branch. You don't have to use any type of global history, so always predict, taken. But it's going to get fused in to 8004. So what's the problem with this? Shouldn't FY be called from other functions besides that? Yeah, so we have over here function Z. And so given the fact how we lay out this function, this can also call function uh, FY which case from this entry point, the return should learn to come back to there. This might not seem very complex, but the notion is for your control flow, uh, however you've staged these functions to call, you might have functions being called millions of times. And the way to do this, and, and this picture right here is not even a very intensive in that uh, what you're going to have is functions calling multiple functions. What we need to do is instead of using the BTB for returns, is instead have a return address stack, which this would just simply say, for when this call is made, what we'd put in that return address stack would be 8004. We enter over in the function y when we get to this return, rather, rather than this return getting its information from the, the traditional entry, it would actually just default to saying, well, this is a return address, so go use the stack. And the reason why it's a stack is we can have nested function calls. We can have function A called function B called function C, back to function A, like meaning calling again function A. You can have all sorts of traversals when you start looking at any type of linked data structure. So generally what's deployed now is about an entry of a, re uh, a return address stack of about 32 entries. So in this particular case, if you had some type of unique path of function calls, function A calls function B, calls function m, calls function j, calls function c again, calls function a again. If you went more than 32 functions in, the return address stack would stop predicting correctly. It's not the fact that the return address stack is used to govern where you go back to. It's used to predict the pipeline so that as soon as the return is being fetched, all this prediction is happening. So tell me what happens in this case. So it's good for that. Let me see what I can... Do this. So what happens in this case? Here's function x. If everyone loves recursive functions. Here's function x. And let's say that this gets called 
50 times? Or are we going to have mispredicts in this case? We said most return address stacks are about 32 entries. And I'm saying that this is going to, function X calls itself 50 times. Yeah, I mean, you're going to saturate the uh, table, but it's going to have the same value every time it gets called. So if it's smart enough, it can look and say this is all the same value. Yeah, so, so what's going to happen here, if we put this function X here at, again, address 9,000, and where it's supposed to return back to after it calls this function is 9,004, what you'll be putting here is the return address stack for each one of these calls will get loaded up with 9,004. So even if we've called 50 or 5,000, the return address stack doesn't matter if it flushes out. It's not going to give up. It's just going to look at. So if, if you start returning addresses and it starts mispredicting these, it's just going to give you, well, here's, here's what the stack says. So in the, re in the recursive case of just one recursive site, it will do well. But if you, had multi, if you had an if statement in here that said call fx with these par parameters, else call this, then all bets are off in terms of that. Good. You see, start to see what part of the chip dominates as far as trying to get more efficiency out of that pipeline. This loop predictor, return address predictor, these seem like small cases. You know, how many times are you going to write a unique function path call that goes down a depth more than 8, more than 16. Well, if you're talking about coming from certain OS calls, could happen quite often. Okay. Otherwise, for return address stack prediction, you can look here. These are just some experimental results that have been provided that say, what is the ideal return address stack size across these spec programs? You'll have a chance to uh, not deal with these. These are a little bit older. I think these are coming from spec 96. I see Espresso, GCC, uh, but you get a feel of that. Otherwise, if you're interested in other ideas, I think one of the reading review assignments that I, I gave you for a potential was the Perceptron branch predictor. Uh, and this is Daniel Jimenez um, and I think Dave, Calvin Lin. Uh, and they've done some work not just in 2001, so if you want a more modern paper, you can go look for it. But the, the perceptron being some way to weigh out those branches in a branch history register. So the same concept of having a variable length, but now what we want to do is base the prediction, uh, giving each branch in the history a different weight and we can, so that we can specialize the current branch, uh, looking up into the history correlation information. And that, ha again, has been... Um, substantial in terms of getting some more performance. I'm not sure if there's, there's uh, been systems that have implemented something close to this, but what I've talked about in terms of if you're more interested in branch prediction, there's that branch prediction championship contest, as well as there's, there's a lot of work out there. Okay. That, I think, uh, gives us ways to get the instruction fetch engine more visibility, a larger window of those instructions. What we have to study then next is really the concept of superscalar architectures, and that I've, I've put together the superscalar slides. So these superscalar slides go over the Tamasulu algorithm. Let me full screen mode. So when we say superscalar execution, really meaning uh, we mean it as executing more than one instruction at a time. But when we talk about it with dynamic al that dynamic Thomas's algorithm, it also applies to overcoming limitations within the instruction set. So, for instance, the first the architecture, the IBM 360, this architecture was before there were caches. It was also before there was plentiful number of registers. So there's only a small number of floating point registers. We're talking about four registers versus right now what you would think is most architectures coming out either at least have 32 registers as far as risk architectures. Uh, the, also, the goal back there in the 1960s was how do you get performance without having compiler technology? Not that they didn't view that as an alternative, they just didn't have languages and compilers. Uh, you know, most of the time, the scientists who had access to the machine, they were actually writing assembly code. So what you wanted to offer them is you still have to write assembly code as languages get developed, but we want to get you more and more performance, uh, and, and that's one of the things that the system did as far as overcome some of these hardware issues. 
hardware limitations. And so why are we studying a machine like this? Why do we first look at it? It's really the fact that all out-of-order execution models you know, really stem from this. So there's been an alpha architecture, HP, MIPS, Pentium architectures uh, have really gone about the same way. And, and there's a couple of terms when we look at this. And again, knowing some background if you're not coming from architecture design, it's very high level here. So let's start off just naming a few of these things, what we call functional units. That's really going to refer to any uh, component or section of the chip that can perform arithmetic logic work. So that could be an integer functional unit or a floating point functional unit. Make the separation between those. Uh, you wouldn't have an integer unit. Um, you know, you, you won't send a floating point operation to an integer unit, which is only going to have so much logic in terms of two's complement manipulation. So another system called a reservation station. So much like what you'd think in terms of reserving work, well, these uh, reservation stations are going to keep track of when an instruction is ready to execute in the system. What we want to do with, Dyna with Tamasu's algorithm is really generate uh, a dynamic data dependence, uh, sorry, dynamic data flow graph of the instructions being executed. So if the branch predictor is getting us all these useful instructions because it's 96%, 97% accuracy, we have this field of view that we want the system to then rearrange the instructions in a more optimal order than, in, than uh, the order that they arrive in. So what we call the, the issue order or the decode order. Uh, to do that, we need something called register renaming. And this is what overcomes certain problems or, or dependencies within the architecture. So uh, let me review these terms, which is another reason why I have the PowerPoint slides. So there's hazards within any pipeline architecture. And we usually make, I usually make a table of these, and we'll see how well this works. Not bad. Let's go with a new slide. So there's five, uh, there's three types of um, dependencies that matter in terms of for registers. So if we're looking at dependencies, we have the following breakdown. We have a read after write. So anytime we have a R, it's just going to stand for read. And you'll get this from the reading assignment, but it's good to review because we'll start talking about these things as, as um, just common nature. So if you have a read after write, this is also called a flow dependence. We also list this as just an arrow from one point to another. We also have an output dependence, and that's called a right after right. We designate that with an arrow with a uh, circle or an O in the middle. And then we have an anti-dependence. And this is a right after read. We have an arrow and then a line through it. So these are the three types of dependencies that when you look over any instruction sequence, when it comes in and arrives in a, in a sequential fashion, which all machines should be able to execute their, their code in a sequential fashion, obeying these dependencies gets you the same behavior, uh, gets you the original thought behavior of, of what the program was eliciting to the machine. But with this, flow is the only real one. So this is real. These are false. I'll give an example of all of these. So for instance, if we have the following code, and I'm just going to write out. So for instance, register one is an add. The first operation is an add, and it says R2 plus R3. So one instruction, we don't have any dependencies. The very next instruction says R4 is equal to R1 plus R7. So we're just doing adds here. This is an example of a flow dependence in that we have a read occurring after a write to the same register. So we draw an arrow between that with no slash or O between it. So we know right here if we have these two instructions, instruction you know, one and two, they have to occur in this order as expressed by this dependent sequence. Otherwise, the machine should try to rearrange the instructions. That is, whatever order is more profitable to the execution time. So let's see what we could do in this case. If the next instruction down here, I'll switch back to blue. If the very next instruction is the following, R5 is equal to R6 plus R8, 
Well, in this particular case, this R5 is equal to R6 plus R8. There's no flow dependencies because, in, at least in the visibility, this window of three instructions, there's nothing that is writing to R6. There's no, no instruction that writes to R8. So for any purposes besides uh, precise exception reporting, this instruction could have executed here or it could have executed above this. And at the end of the execution of these three instructions, the same exact registers would be updated. Any, any questions on that? OK, so now let's look at these other two types of, of dependencies. And let me see if I can't erase these two lines just to clear them up. So now let's have this. If we have R4, yeah, let's, let's do something else here. Let's do R1 is equal to, I'm just doing adds plus, and it makes it easier if I, I don't repeat. So R1 is equal to R9 plus R11. So we're calling this instruction four. Where can this instruction execute as far as candidate locations? Uh, so I'll give you multiple choice. Is it A? Can it execute B, C? And you know where it's executing now, D, so maybe that's, you know, can't move. So where are some options for moving this instruction operation for? E and D. Do I have any call for A or B? I heard a lot of C's or D's. So why can't it go above this C location to the B or A location? Because register 1 is still updating and then being used. Yeah, so if we were to, to migrate this instruction, you know, at dynamic execution time, meaning have the hardware, and same thing applies to the compiler. If we move this instruction above here, then a different value from R1 is generated into that instruction too. And so this is where we call, and I'll, I'll try to draw this in a different color so you can see it. You draw this arrow here, and that's an anti-dependence. It's an anti-dependence because you have a write that occurs after the read. So you can't violate that in terms of um, as far as code migration or what's called percolation. You, can't, you, you wouldn't be able to move this instruction around and, rate and change that operation. Uh, another example then of an output dependence in this particular case would also be R1 up to this R1. That would be an output dependence simply because they write to the same exact uh, register. I'm just, just curious. Mm -hmm. So if R1 isn't used after 4, then you could move it to A, correct? Or just not do it at all? Yeah, that's the thing with analyzing dead code, meaning just some fixed window. You have to keep, uh, take a, if I ever teach a compiler class, so this is live variable analysis. You just have to say, if there's no one else reading R1, then what would we do instead of moving operation 4 up? Don't even do it. So if there's nobody using our run, it's dead code. Okay. So that's what compilers figure out. Coming back to this um, example, since we now have within this code sequence, and imagine that everything after this uh, instruction four point, um, it, imagine that we use register five, we use register four, we use this instance of register one. How can we rearrange these instructions with some other techniques to make sure to actually get better performance or better like scheduling capabilities? So, so if we look at a wide issue machine, so you know what I'm talking about. So if we're in these first sequences, we'd say if the machine could only execute one instruction per cycle, I'm going to draw execution time this way. But the width of the machine, I'm going to give you a two-wide machine. Here's a two-wide machine. can execute two instructions at any time. But if we're looking at these four instructions as is, how would we lay those instructions out in this, uh, I'm just going to call this issue window zero, issue window one. Well, we'd end up putting instruction one here. Can anything go with it? Three, three. For three in this case, so I guess we do have some ILP going on here. Uh, and then what comes next? You have to do two. Two has to come next, and then what? And four after it. 
before or after it, just so it doesn't violate that dependence. Now, it depends on, since we're doing it simultaneously, meaning these, for this issue width of two, can we use this previous R1 while we update that? It's questionable whether or not the architecture would allow that. What I want you to see is one way to overcome this, especially with uh, new technologies in terms of uh, new instruction sets. So generally for about 15 years, 20 years, instruction set design, how many registers should go on chip, what opcode should you have available to you, this was what architects were, were trying to figure out. And one thing with this model is if you only have a few registers, then maybe you're stuck to this schedule. But I can change this code just by having more registers where I get a better execution time. And that just means taking this anti-dependence, which we said was a false type of dependence, if now instead of register 1, I just use register 10. So at least within this field, register 10 doesn't have any of those anti-dependences or output dependencies. Now register 10, since this is writing into register 10, we could move this up to all candidate locations A, B, C. So that, again, is just the notion of having more registers in your instruction set. If you don't have more registers in your instruction set, the hardware can also put in behind-the-scene registers. And that's what has had to happen even in the last 10 years with the x86 instruction set. So 10 years ago, the instruction set, 16-bit, 32-bit, only had a limited number of registers, eight registers, EAX, EBX, ECX. Some of you know this if you've coded on, on x86. Uh, so the thing is, behind the scenes, there were over 50 registers. You just dynamically map to them. But any questions on this notion of dependencies? Detecting a schedule, detecting the dependencies, and then rearranging the schedule. Perfect final exam question just to give you instructions of about 15 of them and just say, what's the best order to execute these instructions? If you joke, but... <laughs> Okay, so let's look at how we dynamically schedule. Now, we have to find these dependencies. We, we can do it by pattern matching just with our eyes and we look at the register numbers. It's the same thing the hardware will have to look at. <coughs> this is one reason why I went to... Oh, there we go. Here's the cursor. I went to PDF slides just so that PowerPoint wouldn't bog us down. So... So continue with that. I'm going to show you some pictures. And we'll, we should be able to get through this today because I wanted to, uh, even in the last 15 or so minutes, um, because this is more of watching animations. But we see the fact that with registers and instructions, we want to replace them really with pointers to the dynamic values. And that's what the reservation stations are going to do. Internally, that's called register renaming. Just the same way we dynamically name that to register 10, we want the hardware to temporarily name it to register 10 so that instruction can, can get done as early as possible through out-of-order execution. We want to disobey the in-order sequence of how the instructions come in, execute them out of order, and then retire them or commit them in their original order. But we want to do the work in the, the fastest way possible, which usually takes advantage of instruction-level parallelism. So other things to note, we'll, we'll go through this. As far as results, the functional units come from reservation station entries, not through their registers. So when we look at this picture, uh, you'll see a register file, but you should think about that register file as for stale values, for uh, not in-flight computations, but for registers, or registers that haven't changed in, in some short time window. We'll also see the fact that there's a common data bus, and that common data bus is to make sure that as soon as one result is generated. So if we do generate a result into register 10, we want to make sure that all of the instructions waiting on register 10 can then go the very next cycle. And so that's what we call the common data bus to provide the values being passed around. Otherwise, if you design the architecture to have register 10 be updated, then all of the instructions that are waiting have to read it. And you might have five, you might have 10 instructions reading it. 10 instructions reading is kind of a different form of communication versus the broadcast nature. This common data bus allows the broadcast nature. Other things that we'll have, uh, we'll have loads and stores treated as functional units, uh, but they'll have reservation station entries as well. And then integer instructions can go past branches, allowing floating point operations to look beyond basic blocks. In the examples, what we'll see with this picture, uh, branch prediction really doesn't come in. 
it really just allows us to see this sequence. Let me see if I get back to my, well, these are our slides. Um, so for now, everything we've learned up to this point, the branch predictor is just providing us with a plentiful floating point operation queue. Why it's floating point is the original Tamasulu's machine was operating upon floating point data. This picture could be uh, mapped over to integer and floating point operations, but for now, we just think about it as one pool of instructions come by. They're coming by in order. So let's look at that. Uh, we have, oh, didn't need to draw on there. So we have a couple of these entries. So first of all, we have reservation stations. These are reserving to be able to take out of the queue one at a time, one, one instruction at a time, and really place in a placeholder of the reservation station. So you have three entries in this picture for ads, two reservation stations for multiply. Since you're only grabbing one instruction at a time, this allows you to take an instruction, pull it or put it into this buffer waiting for its results, and then expose more instructions that are in your queue. So you want to get them um, out of the way so that your instruction issue logic can find other things. Because the more you find adds and multiplies, you have this dynamic parallelism happening in the system. Same thing with the loads and stores. Uh, they're just it being issued directly from, from that issue buffer. It gets in this mode. Okay, so other things that the reservation station keeps track of. First, it keeps track of what operation it's performing, keeps track of what values it has versus what, val what instances uh, it's looking for as far as dynamic instructions. So values, if it has values, it will indicate them directly in the reservation station. They'll be have broadcasted from the common data bus. Otherwise, they'll point over to other reservation station entries that are in the process of coming up with resulting values. We also have this other structure called the register result status. This simply indicates whether or not uh, if you come looking, if an instruction comes looking for a register, like register 7, it will indicate whether or not it's going to be generated from one of the reservation station entries or if it's coming from the exact value. And otherwise, we'll look at having these instructions go through really three stages in this first design, being issued from the, the operation queue. And this goes, if it's issued, there's, there can't be, there has to be space in the reservation station. Uh, so there are ways. If we look back in this picture, we see here, if we had this streak of, in the operation queue, we had five ads to do. But that first ad was waiting upon a load to come back, and maybe that load's going to take 20 cycles. We can fill up this reservation station with three ads, preventing us from issuing more ads out. So we just kind of get stuck with that. So there might be five ads and then five floating point operations and the five floating point um, multiply operations might be all ready to go but if we can't peek into them by resolving the first five ads because the first three come here but we can't issue the other two ads to this because the structure only has three entries we can't get to that greater amount of work so other architecture models have looked at Intel AMD have different design philosophies so for instance instead of having two reservation stations, adds and multiplies, or integers and floats, you can have one big reservation station. And that's why some of the design processors differ, because they, they view it as, well, we're going to handle a larger reservation station that handles all of the operation units. Um, and so this way, if we have a burst of any type of instruction, the burst doesn't affect us, because we can just fill the entire reservation station. Whereas here, if you have a burst of four adds, it's possible that you stall off and can't issue multiplies, even though the multiplier is completely free. So that's, that's one thing to note within alternative designs. So, so let's look at a uh, picture of this just going through. This is the floating point operation queue. We're starting off with two loads, a multiply, subtract, a divide, and an add. The D that is occurring after those operations is just indicating double precision. doesn't really affect us in this case, but we do have... We have destination being the first. Let me see if I can. Nope. Um, we have destination being the first field of that register. And then we have the two sources. So if we think about this as this load 
is loading from some integer register to, so re integer registers are indicated by R's, floating point registers are indicated by F's. So what this operation is supposed to do is load from some base location plus 34 into F6, load from another location 45 plus base of R3 into F2. We're supposed to multiply F2 by F4 into F0. We're supposed to subtract F2 from F6, put that into F8, uh, then divide F10 by F6, put that into, I'm sorry, F0 by F6, put that into F10, and then finally add F8 uh, with F2, put that into F6. Um, so right away, are there any anti-dependences here? And where are they? I didn't give you the easy one. I didn't say, are there any flow dependencies here? I said anti-dependencies. F6. F6. So F6 here. Again, got to be able to draw on it. So at this point, we're reading F6 here. But later on, we want to change the value of X, F6 and again, you see this kind of flow. I could ask you to draw the dependence graph for all this, but here's, here's the flow dependence from this load into the subtract, and then here's the anti-dependence at that point. So we know that this add, normally, if we were just executing one operation at a time, that final double precision add would get prevented or delayed. But we see here its result, well, in this case, its result is dependent also upon this, so it's not the best example. Um, just because it, it also depends upon the result of that. So we have a flow dependence, but we'll see that there are dependencies that we want to prevent in this particular case. Uh, we only want to obey the flow dependencies, not anti, not output. So let's start off by looking, if this is the instruction stream, we're gonna be able to issue one instruction at a time. And that first instruction, this load, will go into separate reservation station or called load buffers. Just like we have in, th in this point, we're also using a, a unified reservation. St oh, this, sorry, this is not unified reservation. It looks unified because the slide shows it as a rectangle. Uh, but this reservation station does, it's actually two rectangles pushed together. It has three entries for adds and two entries for multiplies. So if you want to do three multiplies and these two entries are already filled up, you can't issue that. So just note that. That's what's written off to the sign. It's condensing the chart on the previous picture just into looking at this. Other um, hardware element that we have is that, that register result status. And right now it's saying F0, and when it's left blank, just for picture-wise, not exactly a hardware implementation, F0 says since there's no functional unit computing F0, since we're starting right here, then you should really go on to the register file if you want F0. If you want F4, yep, there's nothing in its way right here. So you'll find the result for F4 directly in the register file. What's going to happen is as soon as we issue instructions, we want to keep track of if there's a current in-flight instruction that hasn't finished yet, it's in flight, it should keep us, it should keep track of precisely what position in the reservation station is generating F0. That way we have a dynamic handoff between two instructions and we no longer go through the register file because we said the register file creates these false dependencies of anti and output. So let's look at this and this again, we'll step through it. We might have to go through a little bit next time as well, but let's start off. First thing we do is issue in cycle one. So the times being noted here are the actual cycles. So we say we can only issue one at a time that's not a limitation in modern architectures. If you have a, a wider machine, more logic in the instruction issue logic, you could go ahead and take three instructions, issue them to reservation stations, and, and that is actually what modern, um, even x86 architectures do. This is just, again, a diagram to show you at the time, just even the philosophy. So we issue instruction one at cycle one. We put it in the, the um, load reservation station, or just call it load buffer. That's going to take some cycles to compute loads, even in this architecture for Tamasulu, didn't have cache memory. So cache memory speeding up accesses to long latency memory. Without that, let's say it's going to take, I forget if this example says 10 cycles, 8 cycles, we'll, we'll figure that out. But at this point, we've also had the system 
mark off that for if any other instruction comes looking for F6 in the meantime, they should look into reservation station or operation point load 1, which is just up here. This is why these are just tagged. Load 1, load 2, load 3, add 1, add 2, add 3, multiply 1, multiply 2. So if your original instruction set only had four to six registers, this internally says you can have more registers based upon how, however many register uh, reservation station entries you have. So that way you can expand something and have an instruction set that maybe was built four years ago, but now internally you're giving registers back and saying, well, you don't have to re-modify your code. You don't have to generate new code. You can take the binary you had for, from two to four years ago and just buy your machine and you'll get performance out of it because underneath the hood will untangle the dependencies and it will look like there's more registers even though when you programmed it in assembly code you only knew about four to six registers. x86 case, eight registers at the time. Questions on this? Okay. Next cycle we issue, it's also a load, it gets issued in the second cycle. This top chart is really just keeping track of when each instruction issues, when they complete, and then when they retire the result. You can see here, we very similar to the first load, we just said uh, this load buffer entry is busy, it's going to this address, uh, we update F2, if any other instructions come looking for F2, they should really be dynamically pointed over to this ID and forget about tracking F2 from now on. Come here for the multiply, this is the first, mul the first operation um, that uses one of the results so, uh, as far as one of the uh, tag descriptors or identifiers. So when we're issuing this multiply to this reservation station, since it's a multiply, we put it in the first multiply slot, sets an operation to multiply opcode. Divides are also going to go in, into that box. And we say, well, what do we have right now when we issue this? Well, the F4 register has no conflict. So the first thing the hardware does is looks up for F4, says that value, and that's what's denoted here, R of, uh, of parentheses F4, is indicating, well, you have the exact register file value for register 4, float 4. However, you don't have the correct value yet for your J operand. That's going to come whenever load 2 signals. So imagine when we do implement a cache memory, if this load 2 missed in the cache, and we have different levels of cache, level 1, level 2, level 3, if this missed in the level 1 and level 2 of the cache but hit in level 3, it might be 16 cycles before the data derives back. So, in the, so any instruction waiting upon that also has to wait. But this is how we communicate between them until this Q of J entry is brought over to a value. We know any other operation waiting upon this multiply will also be held up. This multiply is writing into F0, so now we've updated the register status to here. Um, and in this particular example, I guess we're only having the loads take about two cycles. So that very first load going into F6, now this is complete, which just simply means the resulting value from the memory system has come back into this part of the hardware. Well, now this next cycle, when we write the result, this is going to broadcast the result for load 1, it's going to broadcast that F6 is being updated and it's coming from load entry 1, so anything waiting upon that will, will receive a value. In this particular case, there, there is not an instruction waiting upon that, but let me... Uh, professor? Yes. Um, here, F4, where it was loaded into the um, reservation station for the multiply, that, uh, that was latched, right? So, like, if F4 can't change, that value is... Yes, so right now that is a value, so you could view it as, like yeah, it's not a pointer. So anything within these two value columns is exactly that. So, uh, And that also helps out because th there, there is another dynamic scheduling technique um, called scoreboarding, which does have it without a common data bus, no broadcast, where after it has been indicated the, the values are set, it then goes reads the register file. But yeah, these are exact values. So as soon as the operation has all of the operand values that it needs, it can execute in any order. Okay, going to the next cycle, we see that write result 
the load one will broadcast its result. No in-flight instructions needed F6. That's okay. At the same time, and this is part of the parallelism that's happening, at the same time we're writing that result to the common data bus, uh, the memory system returned the value for the second load. It hasn't, again, broadcast that yet. It's just complete within the separate isolated buffer. But now we've gone on to issue the subtract in the fourth cycle so that we're really executing multiple instructions or, or at the same time. Uh, we, again, update the fact that this is going to write into F8. So at F8, we mark that uh, the in-flight result will come from the add one reservation table entry, just down here. Uh, in this case, the very next cycle, let's go through, we'll issue a divide. Now, the divide, what we have out to here is for any operations completing, in order to make this a worthwhile exercise, we're going to give them latency. So, meaning that a divide is going to take 10 cycles, um, and then other operations will have, I'm sorry, multiplying in this case is going to take 10 cycles once it has its results provided. So, coming from this result of load 2, when the load 2 was, per, was broadcast in the right result, that's what we're shifting over, and I don't want to give you a headache by flashing back and forth, but from here, it's in the waiting for load 2, the very next cycle, cycle 5, it says the broadcasted value was received, and that's in terminal, or in, in symbols, this just says, yes, you got a result from memory, address 2. I know that's a little bit encrypted from uh, looking at this, but it just says, well, where, what value is this? Well, memory for address 2 that was really being accessed from that second load position. Now that it has both values, it can begin its countdown of 10 cycles for a multiply. Uh, so that, you know, that's a long latency operation. If we look at older machines, it might have taken that many cycles. Even today, for floating point multiplies and divides, they might take uh, a few cycles. They might take three to five cycles in the pipeline. Uh, but that's going to, before it gets its result out to the F0, it's going to have to count that down. But we still want to go on to other instructions that can be executed in parallel. Uh, timer also starts because that subtract was also waiting upon the F2 result. It's the multiply and the subtract that we're waiting. We know that the subtract, while it occurs after the multiply, subtracts are much simpler in terms of math to perform. So it's going to only have a two cycle delay to it, so it's going to finish earlier, even though it occurred after the multiply in the original sequence. So what we'll get here, I'm just going to step through it, we'll continue on the next day, but what you'll see is subtract will complete at cycle 7, cycle 8 it can broadcast its results, but at the earlier instruction of the multiply still is counting down, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, then it gets down to here. Once it's been done for a multiply, updates to here, and this then the multiply result can feed into the divide. But at the very end, if we go through that top chart, what you'll see is we issued those instructions in order. And that was important uh, from this perspective. We issued them in order. They executed out of order. So 3, 4, 15, 7, 56, 10 is an out of order sequence. Uh, we wrote the results out of order as well as far as broadcast. Uh, and so one issue with the Tamasulu's algorithm is just this alone doesn't get us what is called the general purpose behavior of a machine or precise exception handling. The fact that we took an instruction sequence in, made it execute in an out of order nature. If any of these instructions like that, well, the divide occurs last, but let's go with the multiply or subtract. If one of these instructions had caused an exception, some type of overflow, or just any type of trapping operation for, for memory operations, uh, their out of order nature, we can't build effective debuggers or know where the problem resides because at the end, if we were to stop the machine at the cycle time when the multiply occurred, if this at cycle 16 triggers some problem such as uh, exception, We've already done the subtract. So if we went in and looked at the resulting machine state, it would look as if the subtract already occurred. But that's not the governing sequence we presented to the machine. So it, it started executing it out of order. If any problems came up, you're going to have imprecise results, meaning that register, in this case, register 8 has been updated. You can't ask a debugger 
what the state of the machine is when the multiply had a problem, when instructions after the multiply have finished. You don't know what is the causation of the problem. So, so that's a problem we'll have to build into the systems, precise exception handling and traps. I mean, the same thing would have occurred if, you know, really at the time of the subtract being issued, if we had an actual interrupt, uh, the same thing is the fact that the, the subtract might be allowed to finish, but the multiply needs more cycles. And if we take the interrupt to handle an I.O. device at the point of the subtract occurring, when it goes on to the next, we'd also have imprecise handling of I.O. transactions. That's probably a good point to stop right there. Any last questions on this? Part of the textbook covers this, but we'll see that this just has to come uh, from a natural perspective, meaning that now, knowing that this can be built into a modern architecture with more transistors, uh, what we're really measuring is when this model no longer provides the performance we need it to. So meaning we could build these reservation stations longer, we could have the windows lar larger, but we know that there's going to be a natural limit to how many entries provide greater performance. There's a diminishing return. But we can bank on some performance per, uh, percentage saying, you know, when cache misses occur, an out-of-order execution machine can withstand 50% of level one cache misses, meaning as far as the latency, without stalling the machine. So you'll build up in terms of, uh, of having that, that intuition on what is happening in a modern architecture. Okay, well, I will see you on, on Wednesday.